So, so I think you you remember fusions in that we discussed about translational fusion and transcriptional fusion. So the basic, uh, I'll just put it as fusion. <clears throat> so there are, when you fuse two things and you want them to be expressed together, say you have two genes, you put them up like this, and here is a common promoter. <laughs> Uh, say this is, I will just try once again and let's see how it goes. Say, for example, there is gene A and here is its promoter and you may also have gene B like this. <clears throat> Instead, if you are going to put them together like this, gene A and gene B in one as one operon, right? There are two genes here gene A and gene B, and they are expressed from a common promoter. So if it is upon transcription, what you would you get? You'll get an mRNA, and the mRNA would have, sorry, would have the open reading frames for gene A and gene B, and upon translation, we would get two proteins, protein A and protein B. Okay, we are making when you say transcriptional fusion. This is this would be transcriptional fusion. Okay, um, <clears throat> then let's see what is translational fusion. Then you would understand. And in translational fusion, say you have gene A and gene B, and you want it to be, uh, you want a translational fusion. In that case, we have to do something like this. We'll have one open reading frame. Uh, sorry, we'll make this is assume gene A. Gene A would have, say, on DNA level ATG, and it should open reading frame should have a stop codon, say TGA. Before that, before the stop codon, say you have AGC, there is another codon, okay? Now you have to make a fusion. The fusion uh, for gene B, gene B will have its own ATG and TGA, say, stop codon. So when you say in frame, this is the reading frame. It starts in multiples of three. The first codon is uh, three bases. Then you will have many of them. And then you have this penultimate, that is three. And then this top codon, which the ribosome will re read and terminate the translation. The same will be for the other one as well, uh, for gene B. So now you have to put it in such a way that, or yeah, let me say, this, this top codon is removed, and gene B has its ATG. That should start right away from here. You necessarily don't have to have a gene A. Uh, sorry, the start codon for gene B, right? So here is ATG of start codon of A. You removed this top codon, so you have something like AGC, this one. And then you're going to put... Uh, you're continuing the uh, the next one of the start codon of gene B, and you will have TGA. So this is now one complete ORF. It starts with A, and there are continuous uh, uh, codons of threes, three bases, and eventually stops at TGA. And when a protein is produced, it produces something like uh, it has A and B. This is a fusion protein. This is in frame. OK, I will just uh, describe what is out of frame, and then you can compare with what we already made. So I am putting back uh, another, say, ATG of gene A. And here you have AGC, OK? And because of some mistake, assume that this A is missing. And now I'm going to have T, G, and whatever bases are there, and eventually happening T, G, A. 
Now, the ribosome will start reading bases in threes as codon. Until here, it read fine. And from the, here on, because one, one is missing TGC or say, assume something else is there, it will start reading it in a different frame. Different frame as opposed to what should what B should have been read. Uh, did you understand that, Prarthana? Yes, sir. That is out of frame. Okay. So okay, when, when we are fusing the uh, two open reading frames, one has to ensure that the the reading frame is in proper order. Even if you miss one or more of bases, uh, the reading frame is altered and it is no longer B. Something else will be produced. A part will be produced and there will be something else, that, but not B. That is, it is something like frame shift mutation. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, it, where did you get this question and give me the correct context? So probably I'll sir, be able I, to... I got you I actually mentioned it in one of your videos sir you mentioned in frame and out of frame so okay yes. yeah but th this is what it meant okay sir yeah okay sir i think uh, somebody else wanted about uh, splinkrit pcr before that uh, and inverse pcr i we have discussed do you remember inverse pcr yes sir yeah i will just give so that hopefully this video will be useful for somebody so if we are doing any screening, this is the genome when we don't know where a particular gene is there that confers a particular phenotype. We don't know what the gene is. So what we will do is we will overexpress or try, try transpogenesis or using uh, transposons, we can create mutations, mutants. So, and then we will select the mutant that has lost the phenotype that we are looking at. That means it must have lost the phenotype because the transposon may have insertionally inactivated that particular gene. So we got the mutant uh, during by that. And from mutant, how can we identify the gene? How can we identify the gene is the question. So for that, we, we discussed about uh, inverse PCR. In that case, we should have used a transposon whose sequence is known. So we should have known uh, the sequence of the transposon. If we know the sequence, we know what are all the restriction uh, sites it has. And we can also design uh, primers. There are two advantages that they give, right? So what we will do is we will then use this transposon, create the mutant. Then we are supposed to identify the gene in which the trans in insertional inactivation by the transposon has happened. So we'll isolate the genomic DNA, and then we will digest it with one of the restriction sites. So assume that in the transposon here, I think I have used uh, a GATC based ones, right? I think I described uh, it well in the other one. The more technical details were given in one of the uh, videos. You should be able to watch that. So we can choose um, a restriction site that is not present in the transposon. Say this is BAMH1. We can use uh, ECOR1 and just giving. And then we will isolate that. So the genomic DNA will form several fragments. Some of them may have the, will have the transposon like this. With the with the gene of interest, so all the ends are eco R one ends. Then we can we should add ligase. When we add ligase, they will uh, circularize like this, and the one with the transposon will also circularize something like this. Now we are supposed to treat it with um, something like damage one. In the next slide, there is a, there are figures. We will watch that. But when we uh, use BAM H1, we would have, if there are, these will become smaller pieces. This will also become smaller. And this will also, this will get cut something like this. And in that process, what happens is if, if it is linearized, what you'll get is this is the transposon part. This is the gene part. 
and this will be the transpose one part again. This was actually like this, but because of ligation and digestion, the gene parts, uh, the gene parts have become uh, in in inside, and the transpose one parts are outside like this. Now, because you know the sequence of the prime uh, transpose one, we have designed primers. We can use that and go for Sanger sequencing. That is how uh, we can identify the region in which the insertional inactivation has happened. Here is the um, here is one of the slides that will illustrate the same, but in this is with Drosophila. There will be a little bit changed. The overall principle will remain the same. So we have made um, a lot of uh, we have made mutants out of which we isolated the mutants, and then now we are supposed to find out where which gene is inactivated. So we'll use restriction sites to cut it, and then we will get several fragments like this. And we know the sequence of the uh, transposon. This is the transposon that is hit put, and then we will ligate, and then we we should uh, we can use prime pre CRs. Uh, and to get a amplicon, something like this, and then go for sequencing. Here is a another alternative, or a, actually a better one. Uh, we will see that is called as splinkerit PCR. And first thing before going, we we should understand the setup. For that, we will see what is this splinkerit here. It is basically something like a linker molecule. Uh, or a linker or adapter molecule, you can call it anyway. Only thing is it has top strand like this. And at the end of the top strand, the five prime, three prime end of this top strand can fold upon itself like this. Whereas the bottom strand is something like this one, long one. OK. Uh, there is a, an interesting way of uh, how you can see it. Of course, uh, this is with the GATC. I mean, this must have been a uh, GGA TCC, right? Bam H1 side. So I hope you understood this one. Why did they make this um, loop or intramolecular base pairing is something like this end of this adapter is not use cannot be ligated to anything else, right? If you remember, uh, we, we learned about linkers is that if we have a linker like this, and we add, if you have a DNA molecule and we add linkers, many linkers could add up like this, right? Uh, that is because on the both sides, they are, they are vulnerable to, I mean, ligase can recognize them and add them up. Instead, um, instead, one of the sites, you can put something like this. Now, this is not a substrate for ligase. So you can, uh, ligase cannot act upon it. That is one of the reasons or uh, intellectual design of, um, of these splinkered PCRs. Now look at the scheme of it. So we have had the mutant here, the same way as we were doing it with in inverse PCR. Now we have a transposable element. We isolated the genomic DNA and digested it to restriction sites. And now we are ligating the splinkerate. Right? Splinkerate PCR, it is depicted here. And now we are ligating the splinkerate. Right, splinkered PCR, it is depicted with this hairpin-like thing here. So on both sides, they will add. And nothing else can be added on here or here. Nothing else can be added because those ends are not uh, substrates. Now, when we design the uh, PCR, the splinkered, we also, uh, I think I forgot to mention that, we also have this sequence here. This is uh, S1 primer like here, depicted here. And this is S2 primer, depicted here. This is nested PCR. Uh, this is for nested PCR. I'm unsure if we have discussed, uh, if you remember about nested PCR, it is a simple concept. Only thing is, if the, you have a DNA and you have a gene here, and if you're doubtful of that it's not, uh, the primers are not very specific, you will have primers designed like this, say, and you will do a PCR. So you'll get a product like this. And the second set of PCR uh, primers are somewhere inside, like this. 
So you will, you will say P1 and uh, P2. You will use once to get this product. You will use this product as a template and then use P3 and P4 as primers. You know, it will add specificity to it. Then th when you do PCR like this, you call it as nested PCR. OK? So for that purpose, you can use T1, T2. Uh, that is the primers that are in the, uh, in the transposon. Here, S1 and S2 are in the splinkeret that we are added. We have ligated. Now we can use uh, T1 and T2 or T1 and S1 and do a PCR. And you can also use T2 and S2 and do a PCR. Additionally, you can have a final where you can use T3 with uh, S2 and perform amplify the sequence and go for Sanger sequence. OK? Say the question that should be there is if in a fragment that does not have um, in a fragment that does not have the transposon, what will happen? Say here it got this splinkeret, something like this. Okay, this part of it is the splinkeret, and this is the DNA where trans the transposon is not there. And I'm comparing a fragment with the transposon and a fragment without the transposon, what will happen? In that case, uh, S1 is here, and uh, you added T1, right? You will, not get the, you will not get a product in this case, because this fragment that we have is not having this transposon. No transposon, so no uh, amplification from this side. OK, um, <clears throat> but if you have S1 here, then you might have a product, isn't it? And in that case, if it happens, you know which one is the product. T1 and S1, if they give, they will form a smaller product like this. S1 and S1, because you are ligating the whole splinkeret here, and it will ligate on both the sides. It will form a uh, larger fragment. OK? And that is one of the reasons why you use T1, uh, T1, T2, and eventually T3, which are all specific for the transposon to amplify and then go for sequencing to identify which region, uh, which gene has got mutated. OK? Any, uh, any questions in the to explain something else? Pratna, are you Sorry, sir. My, there's some problem with my internet. Sir, okay, I, okay. sir, when the splinkeret is attached, won't it hinder the process of PCR when the primer is on the other side? When the primer is? Uh, why, won't there be a necessity to add a primer on the other side for the opposite uh, direction PCR, sir? Because This one? Yes, sir. So if, if this strand is being... Uh, Extended, won't the other stand also be needed to be extended? Um, but they will get denatured, right? What do you mean you have? Uh, this Sir, I'm not, I'm not able to understand the step where uh, T1, after T1 and T2 and S1 and S2 sided, I don't understand how PCR will take place. In this case, uh, yes, how sir. PCR will happen? What is the problem? Here, I, I'm drawing here. You can see that, right? I'll say T1 and say S1. I'll put primers there. What's wrong with that? A denaturation step. This will get extended this way, and this one will get extended this way. So the splinkeret will be excluded in the final sequence? No, there is nothing called a, There is nothing excluded. It can add up. Only what you have to see is um, first we are amplifying with S1 and T1, right? Yes. Okay. Oh. Uh, you have to see the design here. See, S1 is from uh, in this part. Okay. S2 is internal to this hairpin loop. 
somewhere here this uh, this this loop will be gone when you use s2 and t1 at uh, t2 i mean why why was why is this a problem Oh, okay, sir. I th I didn't I didn't realize the loop will be gone. I just no, assumed it's it going to there, stay. Even if it is there, uh, how will it be a problem? In PCR, we are using at high temperatures. All the hydrogen bonds are supposedly gone. Uh, will be gone. Okay, sir. Okay, okay this sir. Um, we should. Um, this is supposed to. Yeah, uh, let me check once again. This sequence will actually base pair with this one, right? Should base pair with this, not with this one. If it is Blink one, because uh, five prime to three prime, and three prime extension will happen in this way. T one will be bind to this part, this the lower strand, and will synthesize this way, and the other one will bind here and uh, synthesize. What you need to understand is simply is if the primer is not if if the uh, in pcr we are using high temperature hydrogen bonds are not a problem all these bonds here or here anywhere but okay, uh, the main purpose i think is to avoid any kind of ligation further ligation upon this okay sir okay that's okay, uh, sir. that is the problem yes any others no sir okay any other question if not this one uh, no sir that's all okay how is preparation so far S fine sir <laughs> is uh, today's 11th 12 13 we have class tomorrow and will that be the last one or what i'll stop the recording then we have class tomorrow sir okay uh i want to know is there any project review or something sir uh reviews over for our department okay why isn't anybody showing up <laughs> any idea i'm not sure sir okay sir because of the, maybe because of the preparations okay that's all right when did the review finish uh second jan okay Oh, they finished long time ago. Yes, sir. Okay. 